So I'm gonna to start today with a confession. And that confession is that I'm a scientist. Now this little girl isn't me, but she might as well be. I am a scientist and it's something I'm deeply proud of and absolutely unapologetic about. Although I think that there's probably been some times where my mother would have appreciated some apologies out of me for all of my childhood experiments, including burning the varnish off our kitchen table. <laughs> yep, in fact I did. Now, I don't know if I actually ever apologized for that particular incident, but my mother still uses that table and I went to International Science Fair that year. So early on, I follow the very well-prescribed path in science and engineering. I left my home in rural Arkansas and I went to college and I got a degree in chemistry. And I went on and got a PhD and then did a postdoctoral fellowship at Los Alamos National Lab. You see, I believe because I was on that very well-prescribed path that I was on a path to success. And early on, I started paying a lot more attention in my career to the behaviors of people and teams around me. I was very intrigued by not only how teams came together, but why some teams were successful and why some teams weren't. I was fascinated. I was very interested in, in not only how ideas progressed, but how projects move forward and became products. Now, you can imagine my observations as mostly teams of PhD scientists and engineers. So ponder that for a moment. It was sort of like watching a lot of kids trying to read each other's minds. Now, <clears throat> As I mentioned, I was very intrigued by that how and why, that how and why projects move forward, how and why brilliant ideas were shared and distilled. And what I observed is that the how and why, the how and why always seemed to hinge, hinge on people. Now, I observed how leaders that I admired and were successful how they interact and behaved with their teams. And I observed the behaviors of managers with teams that were struggling. And I really started to think a lot more about my own behaviors and how I might behave if someday I became a leader. And I'm gonna tell you what happened, and it wasn't pretty. I've never actually shared this story before, so what the heck, we'll share it with everybody, right? So I ended up hiding in my car in a parking lot, on the phone with my mother, and absolutely bawling my eyes out, sobbing. I was sobbing uncontrollably, and repeating over and over again, I can't do this. I can't do this. I'm a scientist. I want adventure and exploration and discovery, and now, I'm gonna to have to bring all these people along with me on my quest. I'm a scientist. I don't know the first thing about leading people. How was this girl, this country girl from Arkansas gonna get all these brilliant scientists and engineers to understand her vision? What was my vision? And how is it going to get people engaged when things like leadership and soft skills and development and vision were considered a waste of time. How was I gonna do that? And I was paralyzed. I was absolutely paralyzed with fear and doubt and the sheer scale of, of technical and professional and personal challenges ahead of me. Absolutely paralyzed. And I made a commitment that day to not only observe the behaviors of all of those around me, but to be more conscious of my own behaviors and learn to lead. Now fast forward many years and my career has taken lots of different turns. And I've been fortunate to learn some very significant things along the way. And no matter where I've worked, whether it be academia, 
a national lab, a small company, or a huge global corporation. No matter where I've worked, the single biggest differentiator in moving brilliant ideas and promising technology to reality, that single biggest differentiator is the positive, empowering leadership of people. People. Getting the right people. Inspiring and motivating people. Building diverse, collaborative teams of people. Leading people. And I spent a lot of time working on honing my own skills as a leader and working on the development of my teams and encouraging the development of those around me. And the impact was real. Engagement improved, and the collective overall effort of our technical achievements increased dramatically. The impact was real. You see, what my journey has shown is that success in tech, it's not about tech. Success in tech is not about tech. It's not about where you went to college, your number of degrees. It's not about your patents, publications, or citation index. It's not about the number of lines of code you've written. It's not about any of that. All of that is incredibly important. Your technical competence and technical credibility are incredibly important. But those things alone are not the key to success. The key to success is a positive, empowering leadership behaviors. Now today, today I'm on a mission. I'm on a mission to fill in that missing gap of leadership for technical professionals and technical organizations. Or, more colorfully, I'm on a mission to eliminate shit leadership in tech. I said it. I did. We have a significant gap in leadership skills and STEM professionals. From the Harvard Business Review to Nature, this challenge is highlighted. And we see it and we feel it in our careers and our organizations. But what are we actually doing about it? Almost daily, we're faced with headlines of more fallen tech leaders. Tech leaders that have zero foundation and leadership and disgusting behaviors that have created and promoted toxic cultures. Some have even suggested that the likes of Elizabeth Holm and Travis Kalanick are just the tip of the iceberg. And I believe it. You see, these headlines infuriate me. They infuriate me and they break my heart at the same time. Because remember, at my core, I'm a scientist. And it pains me, it absolutely pains me to think about the brilliant ideas and technology and inspired, innovative STEM professionals that can't move forward because we can't get our act together and learn to lead. It's shameful. Now, I could spend all day sharing horror stories of leadership in tech with all of you, but I've got less than 18 minutes, not 18 hours or 18 days. So instead, what I want to do is share with you what I believe are the three most important aspects of leadership in tech. Those aspects are people, purpose, and engagement. And instead of just talking about these three aspects, I'm going to illustrate these through a highly regarded scientist and leader, someone I admire a great deal, and someone whom you might, have, might not have heard of, J. Robert Oppenheimer. Now, Oppenheimer was the technical director of the Manhattan Project in Los Alamos, New Mexico during World War II. And the Manhattan Project was a massive technical effort undertaken during the war to create our first nuclear weapons. Now, I'm not sharing this example to debate nuclear weapons. I'm sharing this example because of the sheer scale of scientific discovery, technical achievement, and engineering advances that occurred over such an incredibly short period of time, less than three years. Now, arguably, there is no other example in our history that rivals the speed and scale of the Manhattan Project. 
I'm also sharing this example because it's deeply personal. I admire and identify with Oppenheimer in many, many ways. Oppenheimer relished that sense of ex exploration and discovery, that intrinsic value of science and the good it can bring to the world, the same belief that I have. And like me, Oppenheimer struggled significantly with leadership skills in his early days at Los Alamos. Remember that parking lot I shared with you, my crisis in the parking lot? That was a parking lot at Los Alamos National Lab. Now, I have no evidence that Oppenheimer ever hid in his car and cried, but that was all me. But we both struggled with leadership skills in the early days. And like me, Oppenheimer recognized the need for leadership, and he accepted advice and coaching, and he learned to lead. Now, those three important aspects, people, purpose, and engagement. The first most important aspect of leadership in tech is getting the right people. Not only do you need diverse people and expertise, you need people who are capable and willing of work, working together. Oppenheimer recognized early on that he needed highly intelligent scientists with interpersonal skills in key leadership positions at the lab. He needed scientists who could demonstrate collaborative behaviors because without that, the project would not move forward. The second most important aspect of leadership is creating meaning and purpose. Now, as technical folks, we need to understand how things work. We need to understand the big picture and how we fit in. And Oppenheimer recognized that even though there was a war going on and the war drove that mission, he had an amazing ability to instill a robust sense of purpose in every single person that worked at the lab. Not only were they going to win the war, they were going to make history and significant scientific discoveries at the same time. Number three is eliminating barriers and building engagement across the organization. Technical challenges don't get solved with barriers. Now, I don't do well with barriers. <laughs> but our role as a leader, our role as a leader is to eliminate barriers rather than create them and build engagement across our organizations. And Oppenheimer recognized that even though there was an organizational structure in place, he needed to work actively to eliminate silos that might arise in information and knowledge sharing. And he instituted a weekly meeting between all technical staff at the lab where they openly discussed the technical challenges of the project. And many have suggested that it's because of that weekly meeting that the Manhattan Project was able to move forward as rapidly as it did. Now, Oppenheimer was indeed a highly regarded scientist in his own right. But he recognized the importance of leadership. And his technical competence and credibility were absolutely critical to his role at the lab. But it was only one aspect of his leadership abilities that contributed to the overall success of the Manhattan Project. Now, the Manhattan Project began over 75 years ago. And the leadership example of Oppenheimer is still very powerful and relevant today. Today, our world faces grand challenges that may very well be more immense than even the Manhattan Project. Climate change, food and water security, energy. Each of these challenges could very well be the Manhattan Project of our generation. The scientific, the scale of scientific discovery, technical achievement, and engineering advances required to actually address these challenges, that scale is immense. And technical skills alone are not going to address and solve these problems. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not willing to ignore these things. 
because at my core, I am a scientist at heart, and I can't bear the thought of squandering great ideas, technology, and people because we can't learn to lead. I'm not willing to ignore toxic tech culture and more fallen tech leaders, and I'm not willing to ignore the gap in leadership skills and STEM professionals. I'm not willing. I'm on a mission to fill in that missing gap in leadership in technical professionals and technical organizations. I'm on a mission. Will you come with me? Thank you.